So, thank you. We will uh, move to the last speaker before we have our panel. So we have Dr. Derek Cruthier, who is a uh, scientific associate in the Pamela Hashi's lab. Um, Derek trained and did his PhD with Tanya Watts at University of Toronto. And I, I just want to give a shout out for Derek. He has been an extremely collaborative group member in the TIP program. I see him more than I see my family, actually, on a weekly basis on, uh, on uh, the Inspire and Meditor trial. So he's going to give us some uh, uh, preliminary early glimpse into the correlative studies. Derek. All right. Thanks, Lillian, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm really going to talk primarily about Inspire, which is the first trial that Anna mentioned, uh, and present the work that a whole bunch of groups have been doing uh, to come up with genomic and immune uh, correlatives for the study. I have no conflicts. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure, I don't have to say this to this group, but obviously PD-1 blockade um, and PD-L1 blockade is very effective in a variety of tumors, but really um, we don't have a very clear big picture of how this therapy is working. Um, and we also don't really have any reliable way to predict um, in which patients this type of therapy will be effective. Um, and so that's really the focus of, of INSPIRE. <laughs> So just to go over some of the uh, current thinking with PD-1 blockade, I took this from a recent review in Science Translational Medicine. Um, so you can see that typically in people who respond to checkpoint blockade, uh, they tend to have more of a Th1, more CD8 T cell infiltration and activation in the tumor. Uh, these tumors are also typically, uh, they have a higher mutation burden, so they have more neoantigens. Um, and the thinking here is that the more foreign the tumor looks, the more likely the immune response is to, to recognize it. Another theme that emerged is the expression of the ligand for PD-1, PD-L1, um, and the expression of this ligand both on the tumor cell as well as on infiltrating immune cells in the tumor. Um, and lastly, um, immunosuppression, so just the general sort of immune contexture uh, in the tumor microenvironment, is it very suppressive? Are there a lot of regulatory T cells uh, or myelide-derived suppressor cells that are dampening the ongoing immune response? Um, and that tends to be lower in the people who do respond to treatment. Um, and one kind of emerging idea is also that the microbiome uh, may play a role in sort of setting the stage for um, the anti-tumor immune response. And I'm not really going to go into this too much more because I think Ming Xiao will be talking about this uh, later this afternoon. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Um, so just to give a quick refresher on the uh, sampling for Inspire, so there are uh, three, up to three, tumor biopsies. The first one is at baseline, so before they receive any treatment. Uh, the second is at the um, second cycle of treatment, so week six. And then the third biopsy is from the people who either had prolonged stable disease or who had a response and then uh, subsequently progressed. Um, and then, of course, we also have matched uh, blood from all of these patients at pretty well each cycle. And we do immune analysis um, at the first three cycles cycle five, and then every three cycles um, afterwards. So just to give you a quick summary of all of the different work that several groups are doing on these samples, um, so for the blood-based immune correlatives um, and genomic correlatives, um, all of the blood initially goes to Mark Butler's lab, and then they sort of distribute it to all the different groups. Uh, so we're able to do assays on uh, serum or plasma. We can look at circulating tumor DNA. That's uh, Trevor Pugh's group who looks at that, and the thinking is that CT DNA will correlate with tumor burden. Um, we can also look at cytokines in the serum or plasma, as well as metabolites. So for example, uh, Tracy McGaha's group can look by HPLC at the tryptophan to kynurin ratio as a readout of IDO1 activity, um, which is an, immun an immunosuppressive uh, enzyme that the other speakers have introduced. Um, and we can also do multi-parameter flow cytometry, um, which I'll show some examples of uh, in the next few slides. So in addition to the blood-based immune uh, correlatives, we also do several tissue-based immune correlatives. Um, so we can do immunohistochemistry, uh, single color, and we're also currently developing a multicolor approach. Um, there's also genomics approaches that are being taken by uh, Trevor Pugh's group. So they're doing whole exome sequencing to look at mutation burden, and also RNA sequencing to look at whole transcriptome analysis. Um, again, flow cytometry. And we're also, uh, from some of the cohorts, getting patient-derived xenografts. So this is just parts of the tumor that are grown in immunodeficient mice, and this is just additional sort of tumor material to characterize uh, down the road. 
And lastly, we're also doing uh, till expansion and characterization. So that's led by Lin Nguyen's group. Um, and that's to really characterize the tumor infiltrating immune cells and get a better picture of what those cells look like and what they might be recognizing. And so really the goal of all of these uh, is to come up with genomic and immune parameters uh, that correlate with clinical response to pembrolizumab. So is there a way to predict who will respond, who won't respond, or potentially can we predict who will have severe adverse events, uh, and so on. So this is just a quick um, slide. This actually took uh, several people a lot of time to come up with this sort of prioritized workflow uh, of the tissue biopsies. So obviously, we're only getting four 18-gauge uh, core needle biopsies. That's not a lot of tissue. Um, so we need to be very careful in choosing what are uh, our top priorities uh, with this very limited amount of tissue. So uh, from the four core biopsies, the first one always goes into formalin for IHC. And the remaining biopsies get pooled. Um, so we are hopefully getting a nice average of the tumor. Um, they get pooled, and then they get digested using this enzymatic and mechanical uh, dissociation method. And then the single cells get distributed to various groups. So the top priority is always uh, for genomics analysis. So it goes to Trevor Pugh's group, uh, who does whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq. And then really, I'll go through the remaining um, priorities later on. But essentially, they're all composed of immunophenotyping. And it's really the work of um, Pam Ohashi's group, David Brooks, Tracy McGaha, Lynn Nguyen, uh, and Mark Butler, uh, who are involved with that work. Uh, and sort of, you can see over on the left, there are these floating priorities. And so essentially, those are just if we have some leftover cells where we can't meet the next priority, they go into these floating priorities. So that would be things like um, PDX, the patient drive xenografts. Um, and we're also trying to bank some cells for some more advanced analysis um, down the road. So the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, some of the genomics work. So this is uh, from Trevor Pugh's group. This is the UHN-specific setup of um, C Bioportal. And this was developed by Stuart Watt and Trevor Pugh's group. So I thought I would have this pointer work. OK. I'll try to highlight it. Um, so you can see up here, uh, sorry, this is one of the actual patient samples. So when you log in to see Bioportal, you get a whole list of all the different patient samples, and you can click on the one that you're interested in. And this is just showing uh, one of the breast patients from Inspire at their screening biopsy. So you can see up here. Um, the copy number alterations. So this is all of the different chromosomes. And you can see where it's blue, that's a, uh, a loss. And where it's red, it's a gain. Um, and at the end, you can see, I think it says 45%. That's just the total percentage of the genome that's altered. The next track, you can see uh, mutations. So that's the green histograms. Those are really just along the different chromosomes, how many somatic mutations there are um, in this patient. And at the end, you can see the total number of uh, somatic mutations. And then the cool thing for a non-genomics person, like myself, <laughs> is that you can actually look at these patients and it lists all the different mutations that they have. So in this particular example, this person has a P53 mutation. Um, and you can see it's a missets mutation. Uh, and this database is also annotated. So if, if it's a common or a recurring mutation in other cancers, you can see this little flame that pops up. And if you hover over it with your mouse, you can see the citation for that, uh, for that other study. Um, so I'm not going to show any of the RNA-seq data because I don't think it's ready yet. Um, so it'll just take more time. This study only opened fairly recently, but this is uh, some of the genomics data that, uh, that they've generated so far. So the next thing I'm going to show is uh, sort of just a general immunophenotyping panel, looking at just the basic immune cells that one would think of in immunotherapy trials, so T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells, um, and also uh, looking at what those cells are expressing. Um, so this is just a flow plot from a high-grade serous cancer patient from the INSPIRE trial. And this is a tissue biopsy. Uh, and you can see up here, we can gate on lymphocytes uh, and single cells. And then if we look um, specifically at the live cells, uh, we can start to look at lineage markers like CD3 for T cells, CD8 to pick up the CD8 positive T cells. Um, and we can then quantify how many CD8 T cells are actually infiltrating the tumor. Um, but better yet, we can also look then what are those CD8 T cells expressing? So we can look, obviously, at PD-1 would be of interest in the INSPIRE trial. So we can quantitate PD-1 expression on the CD8 T cells. Um, and we can look at co-expression of other sort of um, immune regulatory molecules. So TIGIT is very similar to PD-1. It's also a negative regulator of T cell responses. Um, and we can look at others like CTLA-4, LAG-3, and TIM-3. Um, but we can also look at co-stimulatory molecules, um, like Dr. Snall was mentioning in his presentation. 
um, such as Formin BB. Uh, and it's thought actually that the Formin BB PD1 double positive cells um, are the tumor reactive uh, lymphocytes. So that'll be important later on. Um, and another thing that I wanted to emphasize, uh, sorry, two things I want to emphasize from this type of data. Firstly, is that it varies a lot from patient to patient, which I think is interesting because hopefully it will correlate with who responded and who didn't. Um, and the other uh, interesting thing, I think, is that there seems to be a very uh, dominant focus on CD8 T cells in the literature, and we're trying to go beyond just CD8 T cells, and we're looking at a lot of novel innate immune populations, CD4 T cells, as well as NK cells. Um, so the next panel that I'm going to show is um, an antigen presenting cell panel. And so this particular example is from the blood. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the details for all of these subsets, but really I just want to show that um, we're capable of looking at um, sort of classical dendritic cells and monocytes, but also um, we can gate on the sort of myeloid drive suppressor cells. And we can subset all of these further by um, 11B, 11C, CD14, and CD16. Um, and again, similar to the T cells, we can quantitate the infiltration of these cells, but then also look what molecules are they expressing? Do they have high levels of PDL1, CD80, CD86, and so on? So we can get a good picture of whether they're more pro tumor or anti tumor. And I'm going to skip over the next few just because of lack of time. Um, but I'll quickly highlight um, this one. Uh, it's not just an immunophenotyping panel. So this is um, Tracy McGaha's group can actually sort out different immune populations from the tumor and then do RNA-seq on those sorted cell populations. So get a very clear picture at what are the T cells specifically expressing or what are the tumor cells specifically expressing. And this would be an advantage over just bulk RNA-seq from the whole tumor plus immune cell mixture. Um, so the next one I'm going to show is just a regulatory T cell panel. Um, so regulatory T cells are generally CD4 positive, so we can gate on CD4 positive cells. They're CD25 high and CD127 low. And we can then gate on FOXA3 and Helios. So really, these are all of the markers that one would need to say that they're for sure Tregs. Um, and then we can also, again, do phenotypic characterization. So we can look at things like CD39, which is an ATPase. And if we look in the um, conventional T cells, they're only 4%, whereas the regulatory T cells not surprisingly, they're about 40%. Um, and we can also look at markers like KI67, uh, which would indicate whether the cells are proliferating or not. Um, so in this particular instance, uh, the conventional T cells only have 1% that are actually cycling, whereas the regular T cells have 8%. Um, so we can look at these types of markers in the tumor before and after therapy and see um, really what's going on with the immune system. So uh, I've shown you a whole bunch of different types of assays, and I'm sure you can imagine that it would be very difficult at some point to try to put it all together, especially with clinical data. Um, so that's uh, where this program called Tracker, which uh, Trevor Pugh developed this for Inspire. Um, this is a really useful tool. Uh, so each of the different groups who are involved with the Inspire trial can sort of upload their pieces into this really large, uh, basically, Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then everyone else has access to that data. So you can see here um, we have the patient identification uh, and then really just each of the assays and somebody plugging in uh, the data. So it's a really nice way to sort of keep track of what's going on. And another advantage to Tracker is that there's both a research view and a clinical view. So the clinicians um, who want to have access to like the patient name and MRN and sort of confidential things that can be available in the clinical view, and they can also see the research um, inputs. But it's also nice because then the research view can see clinical data, but without the MRN column and without the patient identifier columns. Um, so it's nice that the research can also then see uh, clinical data. So this is, uh, now I'm just going to show a few examples. Uh, so these are the patients that Anna showed, uh, D003, the me uh, melanoma patient, as well as the uh, sarcoma patient. So this is showing D003, uh, obviously the person who looks like they responded. Um, but what, now what about the immune system? So I'm going to show some immune infiltrates at the baseline biopsy and the on-treatment biopsy. So this is after the flare. Um, so at the baseline biopsy, we can see that um, they have about 13% of the infiltrating lymphocytes are T cells. 
And you can see on treatment, so this is week nine, uh, this is cycle three, you can see that it's increased about four to five fold. So now they have about 60% of the infiltrating lymphocytes are, are T cells. Um, and interestingly, you can see that the CD8 to CD4 T cell, which is about one to two at baseline, has now flipped. Now it's two to one on treatment. So that really indicates that um, there's a large influx or um, proliferation, perhaps, of the CD8 T cells. And another thing to note is that you can see a very small but um, real shift down in CD8 expression, and that's indicative of T cell activation. So another kind of cool, weird thing that happened uh, in this patient is that at baseline, they only had 3% of the infiltrating immune cells were B cells, whereas after treatment, uh, it was up to 22%. So figuring out what that means uh, would be kind of cool. <laughs> And so if we look at the CD8 T cells specifically, um, we can see at baseline, um, they have 23% of the cells are PD1, 41 bb uh, double positive. Um, and then after treatment, the ex proportion that are 41 bb positive really hasn't changed. Um, and it looks like they're all PD1 negative, but really that's just the fact that pembrolizumab has blocked our staining antibody. So they're not actually negative, it's just we can't detect it. And then another marker of interest uh, is TIGIT. So we can see, and sorry, this is another um, immune regulatory molecule similar to PD-1. Um, so we can see at baseline, the total TIGIT positive CD8 T cell population is 57%, whereas after treatment, it's gone up to 93%. Um, and this is sort of speculative, but uh, I think it's interesting because usually these molecules like PD-1 and TIGIT come up when the cells get activated. So this could be indicative of, um, of activated T cells in the tumor. So now this is the other patient that Anna presented. This is E002, the person who did not respond, um, who subsequently um, who died. Uh, so what about their immune system? How is it different? So this is showing, um, again, baseline and on-treatment biopsies. And you can see at baseline, they had about 10% of the infiltrating immune cells were T cells. And then on treatment, it went up to 80%, which is like almost a tenfold increase, which is huge. Um, and the CD8 T cells, uh, sorry, the CD8 to CD4 ratio didn't really change, but again, you can see a really, really substantial drop in the level of CD8 T cell expression, indicating again that these cells are very activated. Um, so I remember actually when I looked at this data um, without knowing the clinical story, I thought for sure that this would be a responder. Um, so it was very interesting to see that they didn't. Um, and what was actually a bit more striking than the tenfold increase in T cells is the fact that the 41 BB positive cells in both CD4 and in CD8 increased almost fivefold from before to after treatment. Um, so you would think that they have a lot of um, tumor reactive lymphocytes in the tumor after treatment. So um, I think this is sort of a good example of why we need to take a really deep dive to understand why both of these people had presumably really good looking immune responses, lots of T cells infiltrating after treatment, um, but really drastically different clinical outcomes. And so I hope I've kind of convinced you or given you a brief snapshot of all the different types of assays and all the different works uh, that people are doing um, on INSPIRE trial to, to really understand that question, or to, sorry, to answer that question of why it's so different. Are there more um, negative regulators coming up on the T cells in the person who didn't respond? Do they have more Tregs, more MDSCs? Is there something different about their tumor? Uh, and so on. So I'm not going to go through all of these again, but really I just want to emphasize again that the objective of all of these uh, is to come up with a list of uh, genomic or immune parameters that correlate with response. Um, but in doing this, we might also learn really just how immune checkpoint inhibitors are actually working, get a big picture, um, and then also reveal strategies for combination therapy. And so with that, uh, just to acknowledge all the different groups who um, really contribute to all of this work. Uh, so Pam and uh, her group, Lillian, the whole clinical team, and then all of the sort of immune phenotyping people, uh, David Brooks, Mark Butler, Tracy McGaha, uh, and Trevor Pugh for the genomics, um, and then Dave Chascon and Laurie Ailes who do the, um, the PDX models. Yeah. Great, thank you. thank you, Derek. Please come to the podium, and also may I invite all the morning speakers, Mario, Phil, 